It's been, uh, when I, anytime I tell a story like this, I have to preference by saying this was decades ago. Decades ago, when I would still surf on the North Shore. Well, I still surf a little bit, uh, uh, barely. But, uh, uh, but sometimes on big days, uh, you find yourself in a predicament where you would actually, even though you're 25, 26 years old, and do that on a regular basis, you actually wish that there was a lifeguard to save you. And for a young guy, you've got to be pretty desperate to uh, kind of start calling out for help. But I, I've done that on a few occasions. One of them, I remember that, um, uh, but there was no lifeguard. And uh, it was pretty desperate. But you've got to get pretty, pretty desperate sometimes to really ask for help. The title of the message is Jesus, the Savior of the World. That indicates there's something we need to be saved from, that he's our Savior. And in this case, is to be saved from the predicament of, of sin. And uh, sometimes... Uh, People have a problem with that. It means you're not perfect. If you're not really sure about that, just check with the person next to you later. Uh, if you still are under the uh, mistaken idea that you're perfect. Never had a selfish thought, nothing, I'm pretty sure. That's why the Bible says, all have sinned to come short of the glory of God. And we need to be forgiven if we're going to have uh, eternal life with the Lord. So Peter here is going to preach his, well, it's the first recorded sermon we have of his He's going to make the case to this Jewish audience that Jesus is the Messiah. In the Greek, we would say he's the Christ. In our vernacular, the Savior, the Savior of the world. Uh, one observation just to make uh, before we get in the message is that what we'll find is that what Peter is doing and the way he is presenting this is unique to Christianity. He's actually giving reasons why people should place their faith in Jesus Christ uh, as, their, as their Savior. Other religions don't do this. Uh, Buddha claims to be the enlightened one. How do we know that? He said so. <laughs> That's all you got. <laughs> you know, the, Muhammad claims to be the, a prophet sent from God. How do we know that? He said so. That's it. Christianity is unique if you look at other world religions. When I came to faith in Christ, I didn't really care about that. I was just desperate and, uh, and wanted to be saved. But once I came to grow in the Lord, I appreciated the fact that, uh, that we have a, a reasonable faith. And we find it even in a sermon from a guy that's, uh, well, he's just a big professional fisherman. He's, he's not a guy that's had uh, a tremendous uh, education or anything. But when he's going to make an appeal for people to say, Jesus is the Messiah, the Christ, the Savior, will you accept that? He kind of does, he he does this for a response. Uh, he gives reasons for it. The other thing that's unique about this idea of Christianity and giving reasons for faith is that it's tied to the real world that we, that we live in. For example, Joseph Smith and his revelation God, from God makes reference to the fact that the moon is made out of cheese and there's little men that live there. I would say that's not really tied to reality there. Uh, Muhammad, when he claims to be a prophet from God and writes to, and has in his words later written the Quran, he claims that Jesus Christ never physically died on the cross. But the Roman historians, Greek historians, Jewish historians, uh, and Christian historians all say, they would argue over reasons why and so forth, but they would all say Jesus physically died on the cross. So there's not an attachment of reality from these other claims made by other religions. So just as an observation, it's uh, very interesting. So because of that, I've kind of looked at Peter's message here that we're going to look at in, uh, in Acts 2 in a moment. Is, uh, and I've broken it down to his four main reasons why that audience today, why people should, day, should today as well, uh, place their faith in Jesus as the Messiah. And again, he gives a, a response. But the other thing that's unique to Christianity that we'll see in the message as well is there's a tie to this idea of knowing truth because it's only in the truth that you face about yourself and your need for a Savior uh, that is provided to us by God because he loves us. The Apostle Paul says at one point in time in his letter to the church at Rome that God demonstrated his love for us in this, 
Yet while we were sinners, Christ died for our sins. It wasn't because anything we did, God the Father sent his son because he loved us. But it's only in knowing the truth of why he died that we can fully experience uh, his love. Now, there was a group of, uh, of philosophers that kind of grasped this idea, I think, and one of their uh, contemporary uh, works that they published in 2003 really expressed this idea very well. This group of contemporary philosophers is known as the Black Eyed Peas. I don't know if you've ever heard of them before, but in 2003 they released an, uh, an album entitled Where is Love? And the main song of that title, uh, some of the lyrics say, people killing, people dying, children hurt and you hear them crying. Can you practice what you preach? And would you turn the other cheek? Father, 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 help us. Send us some guidance from above. Because people got me, got me questioning, where is the love? Wrong information, always shown by the media. Negative images is the main criteria. Infecting the young minds faster than bacteria. Kids want to act like what they see in the cinema. Yo. Sorry, it's just in there. <laughs> Could have dropped that, but I chose not to. Whatever happened to the values of humanity, whatever happened to the fairness and equality, instead of spreading love, we're spreading animosity. The truth is kept secret. It's swept under the rug. If you never know truth, then you will never know love. Father, 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 help us. Send us some guidance from above, because people got me, got me questioning, where is the love? And I agree with that line. You really can't know the love of God if you don't face the truth of your own predicament in the need of a Savior. Well, let's take a look. If you've got a Bible and want to follow, follow along, we're in Acts chapter 2, uh, starting in verse 36. Certainly Peter's uh, message began, uh, began a little bit before this, uh, but we're going to jump in at verse 22. Men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested by God to you by miracles wonders and signs which God did through him in your midst. As you yourselves also know, him being delivered by the determined purpose and foreknowledge of God, you have taken by lawless hands, have crucified and put to death, whom God raised up, having loosed the pains of death, because it was not possible that he should be held by it. For David says concerning him, I foresaw the Lord always before my face, for he is at my right hand that I may not be shaken. Therefore my heart rejoiced and my tongue was glad. Moreover, my flesh also will rest in hope. For you will not leave my soul in Hades, nor will you allow your Holy One to see corruption. You have made known to me the ways of life. You will make me full of joy in your presence. Men and brethren, let me speak freely to you of the patriarch David, that he is both dead and buried and his tomb is with us. Uh, to this day. Therefore, being a prophet and knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him that of the fruit of his body, according to the flesh, he would raise up the Christ to sit on his throne. He, foreseeing this, spoke concerning the resurrection of the Christ, that his soul was not left in Hades, nor did his flesh see corruption. This Jesus God has raised up, of which we are all witnesses. Therefore, being exalted to the right hand of God and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he poured out this which you now see and hear. For David did not ascend into the heavens, but he says himself, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God has made this Jesus whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. So reason number one that Peter gives he says that Jesus demonstrated by his life that he was the Messiah sent from God. Is Jesus the Messiah? Is he the Christ? Is he the Savior? And Peter says, uh, because of his life, notice verse 22, he's a man attested by God to you by what? Miracles, wonders, and signs which God did through him uh, in your midst. So by his life in terms of his miracles, and as we've studied the 
the Gospels, we've noted that Jesus did not do miracles in terms of a few uh, or 10 or 20 or hundreds or even a thousand. They're more like tens of thousands. We look at the population of the Galilee area and we know that every person in that whole region was brought to him that was sick. Not some of them, not most of them. All of them were, were miraculously healed. And that continued, and Jesus did that, of course, right in the temple courts, right in Jerusalem. And so Peter makes his case. Is Jesus the Savior of the world? Yeah, because of his life. Because in his life, he did tens of thousands of miracles, and, uh, including healing people, uh, as well as casting out demons, turning water into wine, and so forth. But there's a turning point in the life of Jesus uh, that's very important to understand in Matthew 12, 22, because the battle of, of Jesus was really against uh, that corrupt Jewish leadership there in Jerusalem, the Sanhedrin, not all of them, but most of them. Most of them Pharisees, a few Sadducees. But uh, here he is in, in Matthew 22, when they bring to Jesus what they hope is something that will disprove the fact that he is not the Savior. That is, according to rabbinical teaching at the time, only the Messiah would be able to cast a demon out of someone who could not speak and could not hear. And we could go in for lots of the reasons and give you the, uh, the, the, uh, the proof text in the book of Acts and a few other places. But that was the belief at that day. They find a guy. He is, cannot speak, he cannot hear, and he's demon-possessed. Now all they got to do is get this guy in front of Jesus, see if he can heal him. Of course, he's not going to be able to. They're thinking, and they'll disprove that he is not the Messiah. But this is what happens in Matthew 12, 22. Then one of them was brought to him who was demon-possessed, blind and mute, and he healed him so that the blind and mute man could uh, both spoke and saw and all the multitudes were amazed and said, could this be the son of David? Just another term for the Messiah, the Savior. Is this him? He did what only the Messiah could do. And of course, the Pharisees at this point are, are, have a real issue on their hands. They have two options. They can either bow down and worship him as, uh, as their Lord and Savior. That was option number one. Or they had to figure out, how do we deal with the damage control? Because we're not going to do this. How do we explain what just happened? Well, they do that in verse 24 when it says, Now when the Pharisees heard it, they said, This fellow does not cast out demons except by Beelzebub, the ruler of the demons. He did it by the power of Satan, is their explanations. They had a choice. They could decide, is Jesus the Savior of the world or not? But if he's not, then who is he? How do we account for all of the miracles, all the signs, and the wonders? And of course, people are in that dilemma today. The Oxford scholar C.S. Lewis summed it up this way about Jesus, because there's always the attempt of people to patronize him and say, well, I believe he was a good man, he was a good teacher, he was even a great rabbi. But Lewis says this in his classic work, Mere Christianity. I am uh, trying here to prevent anyone saying the really foolish thing that people often say about him. I'm ready to accept Jesus as a great moral teacher, but I don't accept his claim to be God. That is one thing we must not say. A man who was merely a man and said the sort of things Jesus said would not be a great moral teacher. He would either be a lunatic on the level with the man who says he's a poached egg, or else he would be the devil of hell. You must make your choice. Either this man was and is the son of God, or else a madman or something worse. You can shut him up for a fool. You can spit at him and kill him as a demon. Or you can fall at his feet and call him Lord and God. But let us not come with any patronizing nonsense about him being a great human teacher. He has not left that open to us. He did not intend to. Lewis says that, uh, and we kind of summarize of Jesus, you'll have to decide he is either a lunatic, he is a liar, or he is the Lord God, the Savior of the world. And Peter says, he makes this reasonable request to say, consider the fact that in his life, you all know this, you all saw this, of the signs and the wonders and the miracles that he did. And secondly, in his life, he makes reference to a fulfilled prophecy. Jesus not only came and did the miracles, he fulfilled all the prophecies spoken about the Messiah. He had to be born, of course, in Bethlehem. He had to be of the seed of David. He had to come out of Egypt. He had to be called a, a Nazarene. He had to be, uh, again, crucified on a cross predicted by uh, David as a prophet, again, 
uh, many hundreds of years before crucifixion was ever, uh, ever invented as a form of capital punishment. On and on it goes. He had to be buried with the rich. His clothes had to be gambled for. Not one of his bones could be broken in all the details. Some scholars would say there's at least uh, 456 specific prophecies that Jesus fulfilled in his birth, in his life, and in his death. Peter Stoner, in his uh, classic work, uh, Science Speaks, Peter Stoner at one time was uh, the head of the Department of Mathematics and Astronomy at uh, Pasadena City College and later at, uh, at Westmont. Uh, writing a number of years ago, did the math, did the calculations in terms of what is the probability of somebody coming along like Jesus and fulfilling prophecies the way he did. Now, to fulfill 400, it's too big of a number. So he says, for example, to fulfill eight prophecies, detailed prophecies, uh, what would be the odds that someone could come along, be born at the right place, do the right things to fulfill these things? Uh, and he says it's a 1 in 10 to the 17th power. <clears throat> That's a, a 10 with 17 zeros behind it. And he illustrates it this way to kind of help our minds get around the number. And he said, if you could fill the state of Texas, I've been there a few times, it's pretty big. If you could fill the state of Texas two feet deep in silver dollars and then blind someone and send them off into the state of Texas to find one silver dollar that had a special marking on it. And if that person could wander around for several days through the state of Texas, <coughs> blindfolded, and then reach down and pull out that silver dollar, that's the number we're talking about. Those are the odds of someone like Jesus fulfilling not hundreds and not dozens, but just eight prophecy. Peter Stoner, in his book, Science Speaks, he goes on and says, well, how about 25 and how about 45? And the, uh, the examples and the numbers are just, uh, just staggering. So Peter says, reason number one, in his life, the fulfillment of prophecy, the way that he did all of these miracles, he goes, that should be enough reason for you to believe that Jesus is the Messiah. But the second reason he gives is in his death, verse 23, him being delivered by the determined purpose and foreknowledge of God. God, in a sense, he says, planned the death of Jesus. It was the reason that he was born, that he would go to the cross, that he would die on that cross for our sins. John says, uh, excuse me, Jesus says in John 7, uh, 17 that no man takes my life, I give it freely. And we know that Jesus made reference to going to the cross and dying and told his disciples many times. Isaiah the prophet predicted this in Isaiah 53.10 where it says, Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. Some translations again would say crush him. Uh, he has put him to grief, or the idea of his death, when you make his soul an offering for sin. Sometimes uh, 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 we'll ask the question, people will ask the question, who killed Jesus? Well, Peter says here, in reality, it was God, the Father, that sent Jesus predetermined to die for uh, the sins of the world. And he dies by those whose hands had rejected him. Look at verse 23. You have taken by lawless hands, there was nothing lawful about what was happening, he was an innocent man, have crucified and, and put to death. And certainly it was the corrupt Jewish leadership of the day that was responsible, that appealed to Pilate and so forth uh, to crucify him. It was, of course, Pilate that had to render the judgment, although he said uh, on uh, at least three occasions that the guy's innocent. He tried to wash his hands of the whole thing. His wife warns him in a dream the night before, have nothing to do with this innocent man. But, uh, but he goes along with the crowd, fearing his own position and uh, his power and his career. And he sends Jesus to the cross. And of course, it was the Roman soldiers that actually physically crucified him. Uh, therefore, it was really the Romans, the Italians that did it. So let's get the Italians. No, there's a few of them out here. But uh, uh, it really wasn't that. Peter says it was God the Father sent him on a predetermined plan to die for our sins. And Peter, writing, writing late, later in his own epistle in 1 Peter 3.18 would say the reason for it, it was a sacrifice for our sins. For Christ also suffered once for sins, the just for the unjust. Now here's the reason, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but being made alive by the Spirit. The purpose of Christ dying on the cross, Peter said that he might bring us to God. It's a phrase that 
that is a technical term that means to gain an audience in court. It's talking about the fact that because Christ died for us and for our sins, those sins that separated us from God, because he now removes or takes those sins away from us by his sacrifice, hey, we can come before God. We can, we can talk to him. We can have a prayer life. Uh, it's meaningful. We often say, we evangelical Christians, that we have a personal relationship with God because we can come and talk to him, to his throne, which is a throne of grace uh, at any moment. A number of years ago when my daughter was giving birth to her first child who was a daughter and out here at Kaiser Hospital and it was a little bit of a troubled uh, pregnancy because Vanessa wasn't turned the right way and they were hoping she would turn and she could have a natural birth and she was there arriving a, a little earlier and they had her up to the monitors and so forth. Uh, and at one point in time, her heartbeat began to just diminish a bit. And of course, everybody at Kaiser kicked into gear and said, C-section right now. And, uh, uh, and uh, of course, it, in minutes, uh, that baby was delivered and she was fine. And Melissa could say that, I can tell you it makes a difference right at that moment. Do you have a relationship with God? Is there anyone that you can cry out to that can help you at that moment? It makes a difference, not just in eternity, but in this life where there, someone is our Savior, where there's someone has really died for our sins or not. <clears throat> it kind of startled when Kathy and I showed up and everybody kept saying, because we think we're going in to pray for her and she's going to have a C-section later that evening. And all the nurses kept saying, hey, congratulations, congratulations. We're thinking, well, it's kind of different. At parents, it's usually after birth. Maybe it's grandparents. They just kind of kick it up and they do just congratulate you ahead of time. Uh, we didn't know what, uh, as we walked in our little room, that uh, uh, our granddaughter was al already there. Reason number three, it's not just his life in his death. Peter says Jesus demonstrated his identity by the resurrection, that he is the Messiah sent from God. That's in verse 24, whom God raised up, having loosed the pains of death, because it was not possible that he should be held by it. So again, Peter says it was impossible for death to keep its hold on Jesus. Verse 32, this Jesus God has raised up of which we are all witnesses. And then he makes reference, of course, later to the fact that they were all eyewitnesses. We know from the gospel writers that Jesus appeared over a period of 40 days. He appeared to people like his, we'd say his half-brother, step-brother James who was opposed and did not believe that Jesus was the Messiah sent from God until Jesus appears to him after his resurrection. And then we know the, the turn in James' life, and we have his epistle and his writing in the New Testament. And we know and we see in the book of Acts that he becomes a, a leader in the church there uh, in Jerusalem. That we've got the other 11 apostles uh, that end up all going to their death claiming that Jesus rose again from the dead, tortured and martyred for their faith, uh, except for John the Apostle, who was tortured for his faith, but did not die, eventually dies of uh, natural causes as a, an older man there in, uh, in Ephesus. But uh, all of them held to the same story. Why? Because they literally saw Jesus risen from the dead. And he says that of this, and then quotes that King David, uh, and says that basically you should have seen this coming. Now it's interesting, uh, for a very long time, uh, rabbinical writers, Jewish authorities would say, of course, that the Messiah, when he comes, he's going to be the coming king. He's going to establish his kingdom. He's going to sit on his throne in Jerusalem where he will rule and reign. We would say, amen. Yeah, he's coming again to do that. But they didn't really see two comings. They didn't see the first one. They didn't see a Messiah that would come and, as Isaiah said, he would be, die for the sins of the world. But they're changing their thinking about that now, uh, examining the scripture. It's only been in the last 20 or 30 or 40 years that many rabbis are finally admitting that when the Messiah comes, he will die and he has to rise again. It's always been there in the scripture. They just couldn't see it. They couldn't see it when Jesus was there in his life. Peter's trying to show them now. And he does it by quoting a great authority, King, King David. Notice verse 27. He says, notice David said, nor will you allow your Holy One to see corruption or decay or death. Who's the Holy One? Uh, it's the Messiah. It's the Savior. Peter is saying, listen, 
We know all along, you should have known all along that yes, he will come someday to set up his kingdom, but he had to die and resurrect first. And he explains that after the resurrection, that Jesus is then exalted at the right hand of God. And again, quotes Psalm 110 for that. Now, Peter doesn't come up with this idea on his own. He comes up with it because he heard Jesus use this line of argument, this line of reason. He's not just saying, believe it because I said to believe it. He's giving reasons. And he heard Jesus give reasons the same way. In Matthew's Gospel, in Matthew chapter 22, verse 41, here's Jesus arguing, debating, giving reasons with the Pharisees. While the Pharisees were gathered together, Jesus asked them, saying, What do you think about the Christ, the Messiah? Whose son is he? They said to him, The son of David. Everybody knew the prophecies that he had to be in the lineage of David. Just like uh, to be a high priest, you had to have those Levite genes. To be the Messiah, you had to have the Davidic genes. Some people thinking, I think I've got Levi genes somewhere in the closet. <laughs> kind of a different kind of gene. Verse 43, he said to them, How then does David in the spirit call him Lord, saying, The Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. If David calls him Lord, how is it, his, how is it he is his son? And no one was able to answer him a word, nor from that day on did anyone dare question him anymore. He's saying King David made this reference to the fact that the Messiah is his Lord. If it's his son from his lineage, how does he call him Lord? I don't know if there's any dads out there that make reference to their son as <laughs> Lord. Hello, Lord. Would you be getting out of bed anytime today? <laughs> Maybe mowing the lawn or something here? Uh, no, I don't think any of us would call our sons Lord. And they sure wouldn't do it in that culture in that day. David would never say it. So Jesus says, by the way, how do you explain this? If he's in the lineage, but he calls him his Lord. Only if the Messiah pre-existed, only if he is truly the son of God. Uh, and that's his argument here. He is, and that's why he's, he now is at the right hand of the Father uh, in heaven. And I love that verse in Hebrews that says he is able to save completely those who come to God through him because he always lives to intercede for them. Jesus is at the right hand of God making intercession. When he saves us, we are saved completely. Peter says in his life, in his death, and in his resurrection are three reasons why you should believe Jesus is the Savior of the world. The fourth reason he says he demonstrated it by fulfilling a promise, the promise of the Holy Spirit. We see that in verse 33. Therefore, because of everything else he has said, it's pretty good for a gnarly fisherman. Huh? Pretty, good, pretty good sermon for his first shot at here. Therefore, being exalted to the right hand of God and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he poured out this which you now see in here. This is what began this whole thing. The disciples are in the upper room, uh, as instructed by Jesus, waiting for the promise of the Holy Spirit. That God would send his spirit to come down on people who would then change them and transform them. Of these early Christians, the evidence of that was pretty startling, of course. And God gave them the supernatural ability to stand before a crowd of people gathered from all over Asia Minor and Mesopotamia in the Middle East. And many of them spoke in languages that they did not know, but their listeners could understand. The people in the crowd are going, I think you guys have, uh, are drinking already. And, uh, and Peter, of course, uh, jumps up and says, it's not even nine in the morning. And of course, during a feast, a Jewish man wouldn't drink anything before nine in the morning, not even water. He says, it's not even nine in the morning. This is what was spoken of by the prophet Joel. In other words, there's something supernatural going on here, and I want to show you where it is in the Bible. It's not just, we're just going to do this because we feel like doing this. It's scriptural, and it's a fulfillment that the Holy Spirit has come upon us. What you see, what you heard, that was of supernatural origin, was actually of the Holy Spirit. So he's basically making a case to the fact that Jesus not only lived this life with all of these miracles and did it in accordance with prophecy, 
He not only did that, he not only died, as God uh, predicted, he not only rose again, but the fact that he sent his spirit means that he rose again and was seated at the right hand of God because Jesus promised that I will ascend, go to my Father, and I will send the Spirit. If he sent the Spirit, he must be alive. And it brought a tremendous transformation among Peter and others, and a lot of you guys too. Acts 4.13 says, Of the enemies of Christ, when they saw the courage of Peter and John, and realized that they were unschooled, ordinary men, they were astonished, and they took note that these men had been with Jesus. Pretty amazing. I know some people that used to know me before I was a Christian, and if they saw me today, I don't know if they would say I was courageous, but they absolutely would be astonished. I can, I can, I can tell you that. Uh, and that's, that's the wonderful thing about the work of the Holy Spirit. He comes in our lives to bring transformation. Again, the four reasons he lays out his life, his death, his resurrection, the sending of the Holy Spirit. He gives them an opportunity to respond. We see that in verse 37 to 41. Now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? Then Peter said to them, Repent, and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. And you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit for the promises for you and to your children and to all who are afar off, as many as the Lord our God will call. And with many other words, he testified and exhorted them, saying, Be saved from this perverse generation. Then those who gladly received his word were baptized, and that day about 3,000 souls were added to them. So Peter tells them you need to repent, and then they're going to receive uh, two other things. Here's these guys in this crowd. They're listening to Peter. They know all about Jesus. Uh, they know all about the miracles. They know all about him raising Lazarus from the dead. Most of them probably in that crowd saying, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. You know, 50 days before that, what we call Palm Sunday. Yeah, Jesus is the Messiah. He's fulfilled all the prophecies. And of course, they were in town then a few days later when suddenly he's been arrested. And suddenly they now see him dragging across uh, through these cobblestone streets outside the city gate where he then is brutally uh, crucified and they witnessed the whole thing and how depressing it all must have been but now Peter again that they might know the love of God tells them the truth about themselves uh, and about Jesus and the truth about themselves well it's all the light bulb is kind of going off and they're realizing that <laughs> that they have made a major mistake theologically we call this being a deep kimchi <laughs> And, they're, and so it's an interesting phrase is they were cut to the heart. Uh, they were like, oh my goodness, what do we do now? And they're saying, what do we do now? And Peter says, you need to repent. To repent means you, you change your mind. You, you realize that your thinking has been wrong in this case. You've been disagreeing with God and what he says about you and himself. And you change that. You determine to agree with him. It kind of illustrated this way. This is purely uh, theoretical. I'm not saying this has ever happened to me. But let's just say a husband. A husband is asked by his wife, for example, to go out to the garage, get the laundry basket. Of course, that husband goes out there and scans all around, can't see a laundry basket to save his life. Goes back into the house. Sorry, honey, it's not out there. And of course, she marches out there with him. She looks around and goes, what's that right there? See, at that point, that husband is faced with two issues. He could repent right then, right? He could say, she is right and he is wrong. He could change his thinking about that situation. Or he could say something like, oh, that laundry basket. I didn't think he meant that laundry. I was thinking about the other laundry basket. <laughs> See, that's called rationalizing the reality of the situation. And when it comes to our own relationship with God, he says that we need him as a savior. He says that he loves us, but our sin has separated us. We have to admit that that's true, that I am a sinful person by nature, and that the only cure for me is to receive what Christ has done for me on the cross. As Paul said, he that had no sin became sin or a sin offering for us, 
that through him we might become the righteousness of God. And I change my thinking, I repent to agree with that. Just to give you a little tip on the side for the guys and the husbands here. When you're looking in the refrigerator for that thing you're supposed to find or the garage or wherever it is, never come back and say, I couldn't find it. Just say, I couldn't find it. I'm not saying it's not there. I'm just saying I couldn't find it. That's, that's the line you want to use. I might need some help. I'm not saying it's not there. I just, I'm saying I couldn't find it. But uh, uh, repentance. And if you repent, then there's a couple of results that, uh, that comes along with it. Peter says they would receive remission of sins. What is remissions of sins? It means all of your sins are taken away. Every sin that you've ever committed in the past, in the present, or in the future. Uh, John writes this in his epistle. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins. And notice to cleanse us from how much? All unrighteousness. On the other hand, if we say we have not sinned, we make him to be a liar and his word is not in us. Again, like the Pharisees that watched Jesus cast the demon out of that young man that could not speak and hear. They were faced with a dilemma at that point. They could either give some other explanation as to what just happened uh, in regards to the reality that was before them, or they could get on their knees and recognize Jesus was the Savior of the world. Of course, we know the decision that they make. And that is the decision that each of us need to make as these men and women in the crowd did during that day. And then, of course, Peter says, and then they would receive the gift of the Holy Spirit as we respond to God's grace, his love to us, his unmerited favor to us. Sometimes we say that God, God reaches out with grace and we respond with the hand of faith uh, and we receive the forgiveness of sins. That would be enough. But on top of that, then he gives us his Holy Spirit who begins then to change us so that we can live the life that we want to live and live a life that is pleasing to him. It's a transformation. Paul puts it this way in 2 Corinthians 3.18, speaking of Moses who would uh, appear be with God before God and would kind of glow as a result of it and would wear a veil over his faith. He has a relationship with God. He refers to that. We with unveiled faces, we've come to know God. We with unveiled faces all reflect the Lord's glory and are being transformed into his likeness with ever increasing glory, which comes from the Lord, who is the spirit. And I have to tell you, I grew up in the church and never knew that. I never understood that. I thought Christianity was a belief system and then you just kind of toughed it out. And there was a, you followed the, 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 the 10 golden steps, the eight golden rules, the, uh, the avoided the 10 big bad ones or whatever it was. You came up with some systems of some things you're not supposed to do and some other things you're supposed to do. And if you can do that, then you're really a Christian and you're okay. And I didn't know that the Christian life was you just come the way you are. Uh, and Jesus then gets a hold of your life. He forgives you of your sin. Now you have a relationship. Now you can talk to him. Now you can pray to him. Now you open the Bible. It starts to make sense to you because it's a spiritual book. And then he changes you from the inside out. I never really understood that. I kept thinking it, one day, if I could get it together, I would become a Christian. And nothing was further from the truth because I couldn't and you'll never get it together enough so that you think you can have a relationship with God. It's only by his grace. Those Pharisees that day, they had a dilemma. The people in that crowd, not everyone, not everyone was baptized. Not everyone came forward. Not everyone was cut to the heart. And not everyone today that hears a message like this is either. And I think that, uh, that they're, they're kind of like, well, I was just reading because of all the stuff about Titanic. You know, they... They've got, uh, if you've got a few million bucks, uh, probably 40 or so, uh, you can buy everything that was left on the Titanic that they've uh, brought up off the bottom. Some pretty interesting things. I don't know if you've followed that in the news. And of course, with the release of the, uh, the movie in, uh, in 3D, uh, there's uh, been some more things in the, in the paper about the Titanic and in the news. But one of the things that's interesting that I didn't realize before uh, is the fact that um, these lifeboats that went down the side most of them were not full. And uh, again, the Titanic went down on April 14th, 1912, striking an iceberg. 1,500 people uh, died on the ship that not even God could sink was the, uh, the motto there. 
uh, the, it had a certified lifeboat space for 1178 people uh, but of 20 of the lifeboats lowered only a few were filled to capacity and uh, I've got some of the statistics but uh, like in boat number seven it had room for 65 people these are pretty good sized boats Got a little picture of those for you there uh, just 28 were on board uh, anyway, and, and this went on and on. One of the other horrific things about the story is that uh, having been lowered into the water and rowed, of course, away from the ship for fear as it finally went down, they would be pulled down with it. Once that happened and you have everybody else that went down that is now alive in the water, literally freezing to death, of those lifeboats, only one came back to even try to help people get into their ship. And the other ones just set off in the darkness and thank God that they had been saved, but never did a thing to save uh, any, anyone else. Investigators later interviewed all the survivors and tried to figure it out. They came up with two things. Somehow the crew members had misunderstood and had misinformation. They believed that if you put 65 people in one of these boats and lowered it over the side, it would crack in two before it ever hit, hit the water. So they were thinking that it would be a foolish thing to actually fill them to capacity. So it was partially misinformation. And the other thing, of course, is there were a lot of people that could have gotten to a lifeboat, but uh, believed that the Titanic really would never sink. There was no sense of urgency. And sometimes I think people don't place their faith in Jesus as the Messiah, not because it's not a reasonable thing to do. There are many legitimate reasons why. We would say the resurrection of Jesus Christ is one of the most easily proven facts in all antiquity. But it's not the reason. There's not a sense of urgency or they've got some misinformation about what it is to be a Christian and to know God uh, and uh, have a relationship with him. I hope that the misinformation or the lack of a sense of urgency would not stop you from making a, a repenting like these did making a commitment to him this morning. Peter gave him a chance to respond, didn't he? I told him what to do, and I want to do that uh, this morning as well. We're going to pray, and, and uh, I just want to, uh, again, try to help you along. How would you, how would you repent? Well, that's something you've got to do in your own mind, your own heart. You've got to make that, uh, that decision uh, and realize that you need or want to be forgiven from your sins. Uh, just like the guys out on the North Shore that uh, surfing on the big days, if uh, they lose the board and they're going down, they have to make a decision. <laughs> Call out for that lifeguard. He's the savior of the world. But uh, we all have to decide for him to be our savior individually. It can't be because your parents were a Christian, your grandfather was a minister. It doesn't really, that's a great heritage uh, but it won't help you have a relationship with the Lord if you don't make that commitment yourself.